So I get um, lots of questions about, you know, works. And I believe we are using the word sanctification incorrectly, not as the scripture uses it. Um, there is growth in Christ and good works that proceed from it. Uh, but that growth is in the knowledge of Christ, which puts you into a place of rest. Uh, and rest really has to do with your conscience. Um, we're about to do the Hebrews 9 uh, audio, and it's going to talk about how the perfecting of the conscience is what is in view with uh, the tabernacle and its layout. That there's the holiest and there's the holy place separated by a veil. Now the goal of God is to get us into the holiest. And in the holiest, that is called the rest of God. And it's associated with the good land. Uh, the, the good land, the Sabbath rest, and the holiest all uh, really refer to their pictures of partaking of Christ. That's what the scripture says. And the other negative side is the perfecting of the conscience. The conscience has to be satisfied that everything has been done, including sanctification. The scripture tells us we are sanctified. We're called saints uh, by the blood of Jesus. Okay. Um, and the tabernacle layout uh, there's dead works on the one hand and serving the living God on the other hand. Serving the living God is related to entering into the rest and being in the Holy of Holies and ceasing from your works. And those works are dead works as long as they are uh, the result of an unperfected conscience. The only way the conscience can be perfected is by the blood of Jesus. But we try to perfect our conscience by satisfying it with other things. And uh, works being those other things, right? Dead works. Dead works were pictured by the holy place with the showbread and the lampstand and the incense altar, all of which needed to be continually maintained by priests that continually stood to do that. They were appointed to continually stand, and that whole thing was a picture of dead works. It was a picture of not being able to enter into the rest of God. It was a picture of the fact that as long as that holy place stood with its observances and ordinances, there was no way to uh, enter into the Holy of Holies. The way into the holiest had not yet been made manifest. And it signified that a reformation was going to come, where God was going to open it up and bring us in to the holiest of all. And he did that through the death of Christ. And his flesh became a new and living way to bring us into the presence within the veil. So we have been brought in the death of Christ into the holiest of all, where all the work is finished. And it is only from the position of being satisfied that the work is finished. So that you are no longer doing works to try to satisfy your conscience, but you're resting wholly in faith in the blood of Jesus, which not only made you righteous, but also sanctified you through the offering of Christ. And you don't say, I'm trying to get sanctified. You say, I am sanctified. And the Bible tells us we are sanctified. Uh, that, you know, you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified in the name of Jesus and in the spirit of God. And the Bible tells us that sanctification is not a matter of works, but it's a matter of faith. We are sanctified through the belief in the truth. And we are sanctified, uh, sanctify them in thy truth, thy word is truth. And we're sanctified by the washing of the water of the word. We're sanctified by the blood of Jesus, and then we're renewed. And I did a whole series on this, that the real word we want to be using is renewing. We want to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, which is a washing. We're already clean, but we need our feet to be washed, right? Jesus is here to wash us. We do need to be washed because of the flesh and the contamination of the world. But we don't do works to wash ourselves. We believe in the blood of Jesus through the word of God. We, uh, we are being washed by Christ himself. You know, he's presenting the church to himself without wrinkle. How? By the sanctifying, by the washing of the water of the word. 
We are being sanctified through belief in the truth and that faith in the truth concerning what God has done for us in Christ is a washing that renews our inner man. So the inner man needs to be renewed. And in, many people are using words sanctification and connecting it with something outward like doing works for God, right? They think that's your sanctification. No, sanctification is talking about something inward. Yes, we are positionally sanctified, and on the other hand, we are being washed and renewed. When the scripture talks about our experience of sanctification, if you want to call it that, it really uses the word renewing. It's the renewing and the washing. It's the renewing of the inner man and the renewing of the spirit of the mind. And it's that we put on the new man who is being renewed after the knowledge of him who created him. And that new man is holy. That new man is created in the image of Christ after true righteousness and holiness. And we're to put him on. How? Through the renewing of the mind. It's all connected to just walking in the spirit. And walking in the spirit is a matter of believing the gospel. Dead works are works that you do trying to satisfy your conscience. Whether it's through prayer or whether it's through Bible study, whether it's through witnessing to people, if you're doing it to make God more pleased with you, then you're not basing his pleasure on Christ. You're not offering Christ. You're coming up with a strange offering. We're to offer Christ because he is the one that God is satisfied with. And when we see that, that brings us into a rest because we realize I have what Christ, what, what the Father desires. I have Christ. He's the offering that can stand the inspection of the Father. He's what I must bring. And it's by him that I enter into the holiest of all. And in the holiest of all, there is no work. So now, am I saying we don't work? That's a mischaracterization. Paul said, I work yet more than they all, yet not I, but the grace in me. And I was just thinking, like, I tend to think myself, oh, I'm lazy, you know, or whatever. Everybody does. Um, but ever since I entered into the rest of Christ, I've done more work for Christ than I ever had in my whole Christian life. I was useless. As long as I was looking at myself and trying to see if I measured up to a standard, I was pretty much useless. I got so far down into a pit that no one, who was I going to tell the gospel to? I didn't hardly believe I was even saved, you know. But uh, then I preached the gospel to myself. I learned to preach the gospel to myself and bring myself into that washing, that renewal, which brought me into a satisfying rest in the Lord. And I turned on the camera and did it, right? And that was how this YouTube channel started. The last year, I entered the rest at the same time I started the YouTube channel. I had all this doctrinal knowledge of the rest, but I hadn't entered in myself. And the more I have spoken and become clear about our position in Christ and our rest in Him, the more work I've done not as an attempt to satisfy my conscience at all. Someone asked me, you know, shouldn't we tell people to preach the gospel? No, what you should do is tell them about the person and work of Christ until they're so captured with it they can't shut up about it. If you take a kid to a dark room and then you take him out, he's not going to have anything to say. If you take him to Disneyland and he looks around, he's going to talk about it for days. Did you see this? And then we did that. And then we did this. And then the kingdom works by vision. Faith is a matter of vision, seeing what it is God has done in Christ. And then when your heart is full with it, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, I've done more work in my Christian life since I've entered rest than I ever did before. You know, I was thinking about it last night. I was talking. I was fielding emails, some genuine inquiries. So I'm just, like giving little Bible studies and email to help people with their conscience and with matters of the scripture. And then I'm fielding emails that are actually veiled accusations and, and uh, you know, where I have to sift through it, but it turns out to be an attack, you know, so I'm, I'm spending time simultaneously while I'm uh, chatting with some people in, in a prayer circle, while at the same time I'm uh, editing the Colossians messages, right? And I just, you know, I'm doing the Hebrews, I did the Hebrews book, 
and I'm releasing that as an audiobook because there's some people who have dyslexia and can't read, so I'm reading it for them every day uh, and releasing that as an audiobook so they can hear it. And at the same time, I finished the Romans study, and now I'm doing the Colossians book, and I'm editing that while I'm posting the messages, while I'm doing Bible studies, and fielding all the comments on my wall, right? Meanwhile, I'm taking care of my kids and taking care of my family. My the, Here's the thing about a uh, YouTube ministry. We're not like a pastor. We don't get the support of our family. The pastor, everybody knows, oh, that's a pastor. He's going through it. He's under attack. The whole family knows and they have to be in it. With YouTube, because it's all on a screen, the family doesn't know what's going on. So I'm sitting next to my wife, you know, I've got a full-time, I've got a wedding business and we're starting this other business um, that we have to do, uh, or at least we're talking about it. So I'm sitting with my wife, I'm getting accused of being the devil and, and launching, uh, you know, raising up minions who are just going all over the place and all this stuff. I'm being accused of that, hearing accusations about it, got a prayer circle, you know, praying f about it while I'm fielding accusations on my wall and in email while I'm working on the Colossians uh, study and yet my wife doesn't know any of this is going on and I'm trying to just keep a straight face with her and not let her see any of the drama and she's talking on and on about how this business you know if we do if we go into the schools um, and we can do headshot we're talking about a video uh, a business where we do auditions for um, kids who need it for college uh, music auditions and stuff a little video team that goes in and does head, whatever. It doesn't matter. She's working out the finances and I have to engage with her. So I'm doing all this on the side while I'm talking to her about, uh, you know, the business. And I've got this Word document up and I'm looking at Colossians and I'm editing the words and editing. And I'm just like, I stopped for a second. I even told the group, this is what I'm doing right now. And they're like, what? And I realized this is humanly impossible. The amount of stuff I've done in the last eight, nine months has, since I entered really firmly into the rest of Christ has been more than is humanly possible. And it's not credit to me. I'm not, that's not the point. What I'm saying is that this works. The doctrine of Christ works. If I stop, he starts. If I enter into the holy place, or the holiest of all, I'm sorry, and rest with him, the purpose is that Christ would be manifested in me and it's bearing fruit there you look at my wall you see how many people have entered into a more satisfying rest with Christ than in their entire Christian life and have told me you know I'm getting set free I used to let wait I used to have all this condemnation I had so many fears about God and now I love the Lord I can feel, I can feel him. I can sense him. I, when I read the Bible, it's fresh. It's living to me now. That's not flattery to me. All I'm doing is teaching what Paul taught and I'm not the only one. But what I'm saying is that, yeah, the fruit bearing, it's not me. It's Christ in me. Don't think that I was like this before. This is, you know, this is, uh, in fact, it took me 22 years of groping in the dark and crawling on my knees to see the truths I'm seeing now that I'm finally able to share. Groping in the dark. And I swear, I don't think people are going to understand this who don't come to it groping and desperate. You're not going to understand it if you think it's just interesting. Only the people who desperately need it, who see, and it's everybody desperately needs it, but it's only those who see their need for it, you know? And, uh, most people think that they're fine. They've got they've got Christ and they've got some works and they're good. And who are you to say? And what what's revealing ab about their position is, you know, we all know that sin is bad. We all know that. But when you tell them your righteousness is condemned, no, your God is not looking at your righteousness. And when they get offended when you say that you know that they don't believe in imputed righteousness. They don't understand the basics of the gospel. So people are saying, well, you're teaching all these, this meat and deep truths. You got to be patient with those who are slow to get it. No, they're not slow to get it because I'm talking too fast or saying too much or getting too deep. What's happening is it's being revealed that really when it gets right down to it, they don't believe in imputed righteousness. 
they believe in righteousness by works. And how do you know that? Well, because when you tell them that God crucified us on the cross because he's done with us and he's condemned us to death and we have to be buried with Christ in baptism into his death because God has determined that no good dwells in me and no, I don't love God. I don't match the standard at all. Um, and he's taken his eyes off me and he's got his eyes on Christ. And when they, when you say that, they get offended and feel persecuted and say, well, no, you're saying I don't love God. You're saying I don't really do this and that. And they get really upset. That just shows that they're clinging to their own righteousness. That's not my fault. That's just the way this is. You know, that's what's happening. Um, at some degree, people are clinging to their own righteousness. That's why this is so hard to believe. I read Identification Truths and, and Romans 6 through 8 and Colossians and all that for years and just was able to get it in little tiny glimpses. Why? Because I was clinging to my own righteousness. And until I could let it go and see that, no, I can't do, I'm dead. I can't do anything. God had to bring me to a place where I was just done. Checkmate. I didn't have any hope that he was going to do anything for me again. But I had to preach the gospel to myself as a matter of survival. Or I was going to go into a pit. Or I was already in a pit. But I climbed out of the pit, not by my own effort, but by preaching the gospel to myself, God strengthened and nourished me. And then I found that he is for me and he wants to live. And I didn't find it out because... I believe that's what he was going to do. I just started preaching gospel with myself, put it on the camera, and be bam. You know, this last year has been a whirlwind. Like I said, I've done more and been more fruitful in this last year after I had bottomed out, after I saw that there was no good in me, after I saw that the requirement was not on me, and after I thought, God is done with me. There's no way. I, I mean, I'm done. I didn't think he was going to do anything. And then he came in and surprised me. And that's what he does. And I say that in that script. Uh, there's a there's a uh, video I did called Discipleship is Coming to You as an Adversary. Pursue Turns of Peace, right? And I said, you know, when you give up, that was when you discover the faithfulness of God because you realize he doesn't give up. That's when he starts moving. When we die, resurrection is next. And resurrection takes you way beyond anything you thought you could do. I never thought I could do everything I've done this last year. When I just look back and survey the year and, and go, wow, look at all that God has done. Not me. God's done something. And now if you're a wolf and you deny uh, my ministry or whatever, and you don't believe anything that I've done is good, then fine. You know, you don't, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the ones who who are struggling to wonder if they should give up and just rest in Christ. They're being told, no, that's lazy. You need to do something. No. Just hide in Christ. And then, guess what? He's going to manifest himself through you. Maybe not this way. He might do it in another way. We all have different gifts. Mine happens to be a teaching gift. I wasn't even clear about that a year ago. I kind of knew, but... Uh, you know, others have other gifts, hospitality, showing mercy. There's all kinds of gifts. Don't limit God and, and compare yourself to others or uh, even try to figure it out. When you get a heart full of Christ and you're satisfied with him, whatever comes out will be of him. And you'll see he will do much more through you than you ever did for him while you were trying to labor to satisfy your own conscience. Okay, I got a wedding. I'll talk to you later.